Welcome to After Hours, conversations for music educators presented by Amro Music. This is where we share ideas and work towards solutions to better serve your students. This week, Nick Averwater and his three guests from Yamaha will discuss how to access COVID relief funding for your school's music program. This conversation was recorded March 23rd, 2021. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to After Hours Conversations for Music Educators. We're excited that you're going to be joining us tonight. We've got a lot of things that we're going to dive into tonight as it relates to COVID-related funding and ESSER. But before we do that, I've just got some housekeeping items I want to walk through with everybody. First off, if you have any questions that you want to ask our panel tonight, please ensure that you're utilizing that Q&A box down there at the bottom. That's what we're going to be monitoring during tonight's conversation. Now, our next conversation on the calendar, on April 6th, we're going to host Bob Morrison, president of the Watchung Hills School Board, Chris Perkins, principal at Lewisburg High School, and Melissa Gibson, superintendent of the Bald Knob School District, to discuss how to strengthen relationships with your school board, your principal, and your superintendent. So that's an incredible panel, and I'm really looking forward to sitting down and learning how educators can align their efforts with the goals of these really important leaders in our educational community. So excited to welcome. Again, that'll be April 6th, those individuals. Now, if you're looking for this conversation or any of our previous conversations, they can be found online at amromusic.com backslash after hours or wherever you get your podcasts. Now, speaking of podcast, our most recent director spotlight dropped last week, and that was a two-part episode with Leif Cook, band director at Dobbins Bennett High School in Kingsport, Tennessee, an incredible director leading an incredible program. And these are interviews where we sit down and talk about their lessons from the classroom and from the podium, one-on-one -on -one conversations. And as a reminder, these episodes are released directly to your favorite podcast subscription service. So if you're not already a subscriber, hit that subscribe button so you don't miss their conversations. They're a ton of fun and the insights are really, really powerful. Now, lastly, Amro Music, the company that I work for, has graciously agreed to continue supporting After Hours by covering our Zoom webinar membership, as well as the production fees and costs associated with the podcast. So if you enjoy the webinar, if you enjoy the podcast, if you like After Hours, you can support the podcast by purchasing your school supplies and product needs from Amro Music. And you can do so by contacting Seth and Allen, our wonderful director services team. And it's simply Seth at AmroMusic.com or alan at amromusic.com. So that's enough from me. Let's welcome our panel today. Marsha, Heather, Dave, welcome. It's good to see you. Thank you, Nick. Thank you. Good to be here. Excited, excited to have you. So before we dive in, if you don't mind, just do a quick introduction, who you are, what you do, and uh, maybe just a quick highlight of your musical background. So Heather, we'll start with you. Welcome to After Hours. Hi, I'm so glad to be here. Um, I'm Heather Mansell. I'm the marketing manager for education at Yamaha. And I have been with Yamaha for, this is actually going to be my 19th year with the organization, uh, starting at Yamaha Canada. And I've been at Yamaha uh, Corporation of America since 2006. Um, I've been uh, in charge of the education vertical for two years, which basically means everything that Yamaha does for educators um, is our team, who you have right here. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, welcome to After Hours, Heather. We're mm -hmm. excited to have you on. Dave, how are you today? I'm doing great. Thanks for having us. First time, long time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I think you have been probably one of our most frequent uh, watchers on After Hours. So we're excited to have you on as a panelist. It's it's been great to just watch. I mean, over this past year, you know, with all the things that have been going on, it's. It's great to have a constant and your educators that you've been in interviewing have been wonderful. And I mean, we've been learning from them too. So it's been great. So uh, yeah, my name is Dave Gerhardt. I'm the assistant marketing manager for education at Yamaha. Uh, my background is in percussion. So I'm a percussionist, as you can see some of the instruments in the room. Um, I have my doctorate in percussion and education and uh, have been working at Yamaha for about six years now, just helping educators with whatever needs that they have, whether building stronger programs or giving them resources to help them do their job better. So it's a pleasure to be on today. 
Thanks, Dave. Excited to have you on. And Marsha, welcome back. Always great to see a familiar and returning face on After Hours. How are you? Thanks, Nick. I'm doing great. Thanks. So I'm in my fifth year with Yamaha as Senior Director of Education. And uh, but my experience is really classroom based. I spent 23 years as an educator in the public schools. And then my last 14 years as the music supervisor for the Clark County School District, which is headquartered here in Las Vegas. That's great. Well, we're excited to have you back. And again, just thankful for all of the efforts that you're doing and the Yamaha team as, as we uh, really try to steer through this ESSER funding. I mean, this is all new. And so that's what we're going to spend here the next 40 or 50 minutes unpacking with everyone is about these ESSER funds. So Dave, let's you and I get started together. There's a ton of acronyms. There's a ton <laughs> of new terminology that's come out. Help break all of this down so that as we go through this conversation, we know exactly the pieces of the puzzle here we have to work with. Yeah, as an educator and just someone that's been following this, it's, it's overwhelming. There's too many acronyms. And the, the main thing that we really just have to focus in on for K through 12, and which we're really going to talk about K through 12 educators today and how K through 12 educators can access the money. It's really about ESSER. E-S-S-E-R, which is the Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief Fund. So there won't be a quiz at the end, but I mean, there's so many acronyms. We've got CARES Act, we've got the SIRSA Act, we've got, which just passed last week, the American Rescue Plan. So all those acronyms really don't mean anything. I mean, yes, they mean something and they're, they're important to someone, right? But I mean, if, if, if you find that you're getting lost in all these acronyms, just use Google and find out what it means. But today we really wanna focus in on ESSER and ESSER, there's basically three rounds of ESSER. And the three rounds are what we call ESSER 1, ESSER 2 and ESSER 3. And those are part of number one, what passed back March, a year ago, March, 2020 was ESSER 1. And then ESSER 2, which passed in December, and ESSER 3, which just got released last week as part of the American Rescue Plan. So that's what we really want to focus in on, ESSER. Perfect. Now, and please correct me if my misunderstanding is wrong, but from what I understand, so we have the, the CARES Act, which is the overarching legislation. Mm -hmm. And then money is essentially dumped into these various funding um, you know, avenues, one of them being the pay tech. Pay tech, pre, a paycheck protection program, mm -hmm. which a lot of businesses know, one of them being the stimulus checks, and then one of them being ESSER. So this is just a division of the bigger CARES Act that was passed down. So with each right. stimulus package, more money has been placed into these <laughs> ESSER funds. And that's what we're going to mm -hmm. talk about today. Correct? Correct. And the, Correct. the money is just life changing. It's it, there's so much money for education, not just for music education, although we would love our music educators to get a lot of it, you know, but uh, with ESSER 1, ESSER 2 and ESSER 3, there's about $180 billion, maybe even more. I don't know if I'm doing the math wrong, just for K through 12 education. So it's, it's important that we advocate for that money for our programs. Yeah, that's a, that's a lot of money. So, so again, we're just talking about a very, a segment of these various COVID relief, the CARES Act, and, mm -hmm. and today is ESSER. So, Heather, I mean, help us understand. I mean, we, we know the stimulus package, you know, where, where checks just kind of arrived in the mailbox, but ESSER is not going to be like that. It's very no. different. So take us through the path that this fund takes when it leaves the federal government and how it ends up in the hands of music educators. Absolutely. Yeah. So like you mentioned, Nick, like the CARES Act is the overarching relief funding for COVID. So this is one time. It's it's relief funds. So this isn't something that we can plan on year over year. Um, so this is one time funding and it's come through in these three waves. Um, and a big segment of this was for education. So that is the category, unlike, you know, the paycheck protection and other stimulus programs, but this one specifically for education. And then through education are, you know, it keeps segmenting down. So we're talking about ESSER, which is elementary and secondary school. There's also higher ed, but we'll, we might touch on higher ed a little bit later, but there's money for, for colleges and universities too. So what happens is for ESSER, uh, the federal money is allocated to the states. And so every state is going to receive a chunk of money. 
And that chunk of money is based on Title I formulas. So it doesn't mean that if you're at a Title I school, uh, you're not gonna get any money or you're gonna get money. It's basically just a math, the, the math formula that they used to have equitable distribution of the funds going to the state. So that's how it's non-competitive. You're not competing for money in New York. You're not competing for money in California. Your state is gonna get that chunk of money based on that funding formula. So once the states have the money, then they are going to distribute, distribute them to the school districts, which are also called LEAs. So it goes to the state and then it goes to the school districts, again, on the same Title I funding formulas. Um, so that's, that's when we start to see where uh, administrators are going to wanna be a part of the process with teachers giving input as to how to spend the money as it, as it trickles down. I hope that's clear enough. I know it's, it's a lot of blocks down the chain, but you know, that's, that's how it works. And uh, like I was saying, this is kind of a use it or lose it situation. If the money is not spent, it will go back to the, to the federal government. So that's why we want teachers to have a plan so that they can ask for the money for their programs. And we want this money to go to music programs. Yeah, absolutely. And one, one point, yeah, Nick, yeah. and I, I was wrong in the actual amount. I mean, if you, ESSER 1, if every program got a dollar, okay, for ESSER 2, that's multiplied by four. So now we've got one plus four. So now every school got $5. For ESSER 3, which just passed, they get an additional $10. So for every district, if they each got a $1 at the beginning, now they're getting $15. Multiply that by millions of dollars. You know, it's it's so much money. It's, yeah, it's a, amazing. It's a lot of money for sure. Now, now, Marcia, I, I want to unpack the Title One component a little bit more fully because this has been a sticking point of confusion. I know for a lot of mm -hmm. educators, am I a Title One school? Am I not? Does that mean I don't get money? Can, can you help us just unpack the role of Title One and what that means for the ultimate? dollars that schools might have access to? Okay, this is really simple. It has nothing at all to do with it at all. End of story, period. End of story, exclamation point. Title one, whether your school's title one or not, it does not matter. Every school in the district, if the district is a title one district, every school gets it. So here's, here's the problem. To be honest with you, a lot of administrators and leaders in, in the education industry are not even aware of this money. And so they're hearing, they hear title, the words Title I or they hear title something else. So they're just assuming this is what it is. The pro, This is the problem. There's so much um, bad information going out. So let's just start with the fact that if educators learn about this and how the money is disseminated and how much money is available and what they can spend it on, they can be the hero of their school and just go to see their leader, their principal, and just have a sit down and say, you know, I was listening to this webinar and I discovered that blah, 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 blah. And, um, and, share, and share what you've learned and they can use this money to buy other things, not just for the music programs, but also for all kinds of other needs in the school. And I do wanna make a point about urgency, however, because even though these funds don't have to be spent till down the road a little bit from now, um, other people are at the table. And we've all heard what Mary Larson says, you know, if you're not at the table, you're on the menu. So you want to be sure you're right up front. And this is a great time for you to make that list as an educator of what are the things that I've needed for so long that we couldn't afford to buy because they are so expensive, like your larger brass instruments, for example. You know, um, I'll give you some examples down the road uh, from different places, but, you know, that tents, um, you know, new instruments, uh, cleaning and maintenance. I mean, these are all things we're going to have to attend to. And there's funding in these three bills and to take care of all of that stuff. So this is this like nothing is off the table right now. If there's yeah. something that you need, you need to write it down and then put it in priority order and go see your your teacher leaders, which would be your principal. Yeah, yeah that's a great point. So so, so Heather, to be sure I understand and Marcia, I mean, the, the, the Title I formula is establishing how much money ultimately lands at the district level, mm -hmm. but whether or not your school is Title I does not impact whether you have access to the funds that have arrived correct. at your district. Am I communicating that correctly? That's correct. Yeah. So it's up to the districts to distribute the funds amongst the schools, regardless of their Title I status. Mm -hmm. um, 
schools that are private schools, but non basically any school that's not nonprofit is eligible for the funds. So if it's a Catholic school, religious school, uh, charter school, uh, basically most schools are, are eligible for these funds that are, as long as you're associated with a district. Gotcha. Okay, well, that, that's really good to know because the, the, the whole Title I component has thrown kind of some mm -hmm. misunderstandings into, you know, the accessibility of these, of these funds. So again, don't just assume that, hey, I, I'm not a Title I school, this isn't for me, because it very much can be for, for the benefit of your program. So I think that certainly, certainly helps. And so Heather, you touched on that too. It's not just public schools, private schools, there's mm -hmm. some funding opportunities available mm -hmm. too. Do they go through the exact same process that, that the public schools do to access those funds? Yeah, so whoever their coordinator is, I mean, every school is gonna have a coordinator on at some level of the, of the school that works with the district. Um, and th that is the person that needs to communicate with the district uh, about their needs. And if I may, Heather, also, mm -hmm. um, every single school district has someone whose job it is to secure federal funds for education, mm -hmm. pre-COVID, and will certainly be post-COVID, but um, there is someone whose job it is to actually go out and search for them. While they've sort of all dropped, this money's dropped in our lap now. So it might be that you, uh, an educator might want to contact that person to see about if they had individual questions about the funding, for example. But yeah, there's one person or usually an office, like in my large school district, there's a whole office of numbers of people whose job that is to secure funds. So. Yeah, yeah, I know in some small, you know, it could be an assistant superintendent mm -hmm. right. or it could be a, a district CFO. But to your right. point, somebody in that district is responsible for securing federal funds business for their manager. district. Sometimes it's a business manager yeah. for title, so. Just you know, kind of think about who that might be if you might need to access information. So these are the these are the title of the people that we're looking to have that conversation mm -hmm. with about. Hey, I have some needs. I understand there's some funding, and I'd like to well uh, to have a conversation. And I would before that step, I'd probably talk to my principal only because you don't want to sort of step over them and go to somebody else first. So you know, have the conversation with your superintendent or your uh, supervisor. And then uh, if you need to go and get more information, you, you would know who that person is. But your supervisor will probably take that opportunity to, to meet and, and make those decisions. But, you know, don't walk over his head. For her. Great point, Marcia. Thanks. Thank mm -hmm. you. That's a great point. So, so Dave, from what I, okay, so, so as Heather pointed out, the, the, mm -hmm. the funds land at the district level. And then I understand this is very similar to a, a grant type program. So help break down what exactly that means and, and how, you know, the difference between maybe proactive funding of our needs and reactive funding, how that comes into play as it relates to ESSER. So once, once it gets to the district level, then the individual schools are going to be asking for the money. Uh, a lot of the money is going into building refurbishments, especially with the, the updates of the, the, um, circulation systems and the, you know, making sure that there's sanitation stations and masks and all that kind of stuff. But the, the plan will come from the teachers, you know, can we get more instruments? Can we get more bell covers? Can we get these things to help make sure that two things, number one, our students are health, healthy and safe, our faculty are healthy and safe, and also to make sure that we help with the learning loss that happened during this year. So anything that falls under those criteria are things that teachers can ask for for their program. Then taking it to the principal, you know, coming up, uh, here's the money that we have for our district. We, we would like to purchase these things to make sure our students are healthy and safe, our faculty are healthy and safe, and then to make sure that we are making sure that our students are, are not having that learning loss that happened during the year. Those are, that's the steps. Um, the problem is that each state is different. You know, each school district is different. So how you get the money from the district is, is going to be different. So mm -hmm. that's why we're, we're really advocating for coming up with that list, making sure that you are following that criteria. And Marsha has some exact examples that we can talk about. And then going to your administrator, your principal, your supervisor saying, these are how we're going to maintain these things. Let's make sure that we can access that money. Yeah, you know, and some yeah. other things too that I just want to mention um, 
instructional support is another thing specified. There are actually 15 categories to, the, to ESSER. Mm -hmm. And one of them is instructional support. And so what does that mean, hiring new staff? I mean, I'm kind of concerned, for example, about the fact that we've missed a group of beginners, right? And so perhaps we could bring on a new person who could take on a class or two of beginners and beginners may be a couple of grades because we missed a whole year in many cases. So uh, I've heard that that's gonna happen in a couple of districts and I'm just thrilled about that, that they're gonna mm -hmm. bring new staff to, to take care of that. So it's important also to think about teacher training because you might need some training for new software. For example, I hear Eric Whitaker's coming out with a virtual school. He's going to talk about composition writing and writing music. Well, this is something every music educator would be interested in because we're not schooled in being composers, we're educators, you know? But, but things like that are going to become available um, through instructional support. And then I can't say enough about summer programs and I, I don't wanna take all of this over, but it is so important for you to know that there is money available for you to have summer programs. Even if you just want to have a program to get kids enthused about coming back to school again, you know, just playing, playing an instrument, um, coming back to the building. It's so important. There's a big chunk of money for, for summer programs. Mm -hmm. So don't let that get away from you. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great point, Marcia. And so, I mean, Heather, help, I mean, help break down some of the components that we're hearing about. I mean, we've talked about instructional support, mm -hmm. I mean, we've talked about, uh, you know, instrument purchases. What are some of the other big picture ways in that this money has been set aside? And then maybe we'll get granular and talk about specific examples that we see. Sure, like the big categories, um, I would say, let me just bring it up here. Yeah, so you want, you know, you're addressing, you're addressing kind of the categories of instruments and equipment technology and ed tech, all the PPE clinic, cleaning and sanitation category, facilities improvements, instructional support that Marcia mentioned, summer and remediation programs, so that's for students, and also planning for next year, and that's teachers. So those, those would be the main categories that this, that this addresses. And uh, we can specifically go through the 15 points that are, that are laid out, that was laid out beautifully by, by NAFME. Um, and we can give some more examples there. Uh, but those are the main categories that, uh, that we want to address. Um, yeah. And that's because it's not all about instruments and it's not all about uh, you know, software and things like that because we are moving back into different types of programming. It's going to be, for some kids, it's going to be all back in person. And some it's going to be hybrid. And for some teachers are going to pivot and they're going to try and do more things in a hybrid model just because it's worked well for them or they're gonna hang on to what worked well for them. So um, the, the main things to keep in mind are we're addressing keeping students healthy and safe and also addressing the loss of learning that's occurred over the last year. Yeah, that's exactly right. So those are kind of the overarching themes and I really see two things kind of coming out. I mean, you have like the reactive response to COVID, hey, I need to resolve these issues because of COVID that presented themselves. And then there's the proactive, the looking ahead, I need to continue to keep us safe, I need to continue to advance our learning. And so I think there's a couple of different ways, but I have to admit in, in reading it, and correct me if I'm wrong, seems like it's pretty broad. I mean, if you can kind of touch a COVID impact with this, the money's probably available to be used for it. Absolutely. I mean, it, this is such a broad ranging um, provision that it, almost anything you, you can think of that benefits your program could, could be folded into this kind of funding. And again, like we said, it's this one time funding. So you want to you want to come up with a big list. <laughs> yeah. okay, so let me read the 15th category. Yeah, let's do the 15th <laughs> yeah. thing. I'll tell you what I'm trying to say here. Here's number 15. Other activities that are necessary to maintain the operation of and continuity of services in local educational agencies, that's your school, school district, and continuing to employ existing staff of the local education agency. So literally that's anything you can think Everything. of. Everything. It's like on a job description. Other yeah. duties yeah. as assigned. Other yes. duties as assigned. <laughs> totally. 
Well, and, and, and of course, I'm not an educator, but that really opens the door. It's like, hey, I, I've always wanted an assistant. Well, it might be the good time to ask this for that. Is uh, this is the time to ask for anything because this is the only time we're going to have these kinds of resources available. You know what I yeah. mean? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I need new low brass. It's a good time. I need a roll up garage door to increase circulation. Hey, it's a perfect time to, you know, there's so many things yeah. that we could kind of tie to all of this. So Marcia, I mean, there are some school districts already figuring this out. They're already navigating it. Can right. you give us some very specific examples that you see sure of districts can. doing this? So this is one school district up in um, the state of Oregon, and this is ESSER funding that they're using, okay? All right, so um, let's see. We ordered, here we go, 18 French horns, 13 tubas, and this is three schools, only three schools, okay? Nine marimbas, Six bassoons, yeah. six oboes, six berry saxes, and a myriad of other instruments the program has needed for years and years. You know what I mean? I'm reading this from what this person sent me, right? Uh, the district also purchased, and this is really interesting, a 1,500 square foot, that's 30 by 50 canopy tent for outdoor band practices. Okay? Yeah. So these, this is because they found that they need, they had the money to get everything that they needed. So, I mean, I would make a list, a nice long list and start with the most expensive stuff at the top. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's a great know. example. So totally. and, I mean, it's just one example. And and to, yeah. To think really broadly, you know, we're not just talking about instruments. We're talking about the facilities, right. we're talking about the staff, we're talking about professional development, even getting together yes. to plan how you're going to open the school. That's, that's time that should be paid. So, you know, I just, I just want to share all of anything you can think mm -hmm. of is in all three of the versions of the ESSER funds. And I think one area that people forget about are the accessories. Like, you know, you have a budget each year that you buy drum heads and you buy reeds and you buy sticks and you buy whatever why strings. not yeah string sorry <laughs> why not buy a five-year supply of that and then use your budget for the next five years to do something else so you got to think creatively and and having you know maybe you've got an orchestra and a band and a wind ensemble at your school have a set of mallets for each one of those so that they're not sharing mallets across the ensemble you know, be thinking, you know, in, in our elementary school, there's one, in my kids' elementary school, there's one set of string instruments for the school. So every kid in third grade and fourth grade and fifth grade plays that set of instruments. Yeah. So why not buy four or five more sets of strings so kids can actually take the instruments home and learn? Right now, the kids can't take the instruments home because every kid gets to, to touch those instruments for 30 minutes a week. So yeah. now you can use this money to purchase more instruments so that they're not sharing instruments. Or how That's about starting example. new programs? I mean, maybe yeah. you want to start a steel band group at your school. This is a perfect time to, to mm -hmm. do that. Um, you know, a lot of principals have uh, kind of been meeting with teachers to say, well, here's, I need you to teach a, a general music class. And they're like, uh, what? You know, <laughs> and so this is a, a tr an opportunity to start a new ensemble that kids will flock to because it's so unique and so different and it'll attract mariachi, it'll attract other kids mm -hmm. and build your program. I mean, we can rebuild this, it can happen mm -hmm. and use these funds to, to help move it forward. And then take some training courses this summer to learn how to teach those classes and use right? this money to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great point. Now, Dave, one of the things, so, you know, we talked to a district here uh, that's in middle Tennessee and they said, hey, yep, we got the money. The district allocated the entire fund to upgrade the HVAC system in all of their schools, which is a completely, which is a great usage of the funds. And so the directors are saying, we're not getting access to any of those funds. But as I think about it, um, how does the, the third round of CARES Act funding flow into this? I mean, if a director has been told no, is it possible the coffers are going to fill back up and it's worth staying in contact because they might have more money coming here? Correct. So how I talked earlier, ESSER 1 was allocated $13 billion across the U.S., right? ESSER 2 was $54 billion, billion with a B. So a lot of that money has been spent on these facility upgrades, which is great. I mean, our district doesn't have 
air conditionings. So they've been putting in new HVAC systems with air conditioning, great. The money that just was allocated in the last week and a half or so under the American Rescue Plan, ESSER 3 was $126 billion in addition, not added, but in addition to everything that's that's been out there. So if you didn't get the money and you asked last month, ask again, because now there's more money out there. Now, a lot of the money hasn't come down to the states yet. It is still being allocated and, and there actually hasn't been a published list of what is going to each, each district yet. But the way to find it is to Google the name of your state and ESSER. And because what Marcia said earlier, because this is taxpayer money, federal government money, this is all public information. So if I put, I'm in the state of California, I put California and ESSER, there will be a list of my department of, of uh, education for the state of California that actually lists. And on the state of California, there's actually Excel documents and you can go down to the district level and see what each district got on these Excel documents. Cause again, it's all public knowledge. So you can do that for any state, the name of your state, ESSER, and you can find out and have that information so that when you go to your principals and say, do you know XYZ school district got $13 million for the first round? That means we're gonna get $130 million for the third round. Mm -hmm. Now we've got this money to support our program. We need to make sure our kids are safe and we need to address learning loss. Those are the kind of the key phrases, mm -hmm. health and safety, learning loss. Yeah, that, that's great, Dave. So, I mean, Heather, what other resources does Yamaha, because Dave makes it sound pretty easy, just Google, and I know Yamaha has worked really hard to put this great <laughs> suite of tools together as teachers are navigating this process. So what are some of the other resources that Yamaha has through their educator suite to help directors navigate this process? Well, we've had a CARES Act funding blog page since pretty much the beginning of the, of the pandemic so that, you know, teachers can can go on there and kind of look around to see um, what is current. And, and we've done our best to keep that really current. We will, we will definitely share that with everybody on here. And we've been updating that page as we get the information and as, we, as it comes to us and as, it, as it's released. To, like Dave said, the third round of ESSER funding hasn't been published yet in terms of allocations, but that is public information that can go out um, but we are, we are more than happy to help people find funding uh, through ESSERF and other ways too. Um, on our blog, we, we talk about Title IV funding. We talk about looking for grants. I mean, that is a little bit less important right now that we have ESSERF funding right in front of, front of us right now. But those can also play into the bigger conversation that teachers are going to have with their administrators. It's like, okay, well, if we're going to get this uh, ESSERF funding, great. What do we do next year and the year after? And that's where you might want to look at what you're doing for Title IV planning, because Title IV planning is also part of well-rounded education to support music programs. So that is year-over-year -year, um, money for education, yeah, as opposed yeah. to this one-time funding. Yeah. Now, Heather, help us unpack the the timeline of events here. Mm -hmm. That 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 because um, I understand there's there's a deadline for the ESSER two funding, mm -hmm. and then it has to be spent over a certain period of time, and it's not necessarily this year. Can you help us kick that conversation mm -hmm. off about maybe some of the date parameters we need to keep in mind as it relates yeah. to this funding? Okay. So uh, as Dave mentioned, the first round of ESSER funding has already gone out and has already generally been spent. And there is a dashboard and we'll, we can share that where you can see that some school districts have spent it. There's like a little dial they have on almost every state to show kind of where they are with the spending on the first round of funding. So that's the first round. The second round of funding uh, that was passed in December, that money um, is currently being uh, allocated. And when we say allocated, it's being awarded down to the states and to the district. So that process is actually happening right now. So that's why kind of time is of the essence that that ESSER two money, that big, big $54 billion amount is, is going through right now at the, at the district level. So teachers and administrators need to really have their plans uh, ready and having those conversations now through the end of June. The end of June of this year is when all of those awards will generally be, be, be done. There, there's a few like post round award things that will happen if, you know, if they're trying to figure out where to put it all. And I think that 
cuts off in September, but generally it's going to be done by the end of June. Um, you don't want to wait either because there's a lot of people out with their hand out. So you want to get in as soon as you can and have those conversations. So that's the SR2 timeline. So roughly the end of June this year, every state's going to be a little bit different. And the timer on when those monies can be spent by the school um, is, will be one year from the time the money is awarded to them. So once your school finds out how much money you're getting in the S or two, then you have a year after that to spend the money. So that, that timeline is gonna be a little bit different depending on when your money was awarded. But let's just say it's, it, it's gonna be awarded sometime between March and June of this year. So S or three, the biggest amount of money, which was just passed with the 10 times S or one amount, um, we don't have the timeline for that yet, but let's just assume it's gonna follow, follow what ESSER 1 and ESSER 2 were like so that in over the summer, we're gonna find out um, um, how those monies are gonna go out and what the allocations are. And the timeline will roughly be the same. Once that money gets awarded, usually there's an, a year is, is the most likely scenario that, that schools will have to spend that money. That's great. And so, so the fact that you have a whole year also presents a little bit of a strategy, right? As you're as you're putting together your wish list, because I'm thinking, man, I, I I would love, you know, a, a little boost of funding like you know, June 5th this year to prepare for my marching band camp. And hey, if maybe the funding happened to arrive next year, June 4th, which is within the year, so I, there's a little bit of strategy here mm -hmm. as you're posting this together that it doesn't have to be like this lump sum. To Dave's point, you can strategize some of your expenses and try to pull them in forward or spread them out strategically based on when your needs are. Maybe this year's repair budget and next year's repair budget mm -hmm. all get cycled into this ESSER fund. So, I mean, that's something that directors should keep in mind. Is that right, Heather? Absolutely. I think that the more clear your plan is, the more detailed it is the, with, with the long-term vision of a year and a half cycle kind of in your view, you wanna plan for that because if you can plan for it and lay it out, the money will, will likely be available for that if your school agrees with your plan. <laughs> That's great. And we want to make sure we spend the money because if we don't spend the money, it goes back to the feds. That's right. Yeah. So we need to have our hand out asking, advocating for our programs because right, yeah. we don't want that money to go back. Yeah. And, and and we should note, I mean, we we kind of talked about it, but we should note that ESSER is for all K-12. And so other teachers, other programs will also be requesting the same funding. So it's not specific to art. So again, it's grant-based. We have to be proactive. So Marsha, we're, we're hearing about this money. The money's coming down. I've done my research. I know how much money my district has. What are my action steps I need to take now to increase the likelihood that I have access to some of these funding opportunities for my program? So if I'm a, a music educator in a building, um, I would I would meet with all the music educators and have a little powwow and let's all sit down and write this list. If if uh, you could have everything that you ever wanted and money were no object, what would that be? And so you make this huge list and you can either go as a group, which I think going as a group to meet with the principal, it's good and bad. It's good because you've well thought it, you thought it out. One of you represents the whole department or you all go roll the principal over right there. And here we are with our plan, <laughs> but you have to be, you have to determine, you know, your relationship there. But the point is, is that develop that concept of what are our needs and what are the things that can be put off i mean i don't need to you know spend the stuff that cost me a nickel now when i i really need the stuff that cost me five hundred dollars right so put that stuff up toward the top make your list go sit down with your administrator and pitch it because um this is the opportunity the only opportunity you're going to have that's like this i mean and they may not even realize the amount that's coming down in the third um iteration of this i I really don't think people have any idea of the amount. They know that ARP was passed and they know, oh, there's more money coming. I don't, nobody knows how much money it is. And I don't know if you can fathom how much 120 some billion dollars is, but it's a lot. There are districts getting tens of millions of dollars mm -hmm. and you know, this is the time. So don't, don't let uh, grass grow, do your work, do your homework, uh, meet with your other music educators and come up with a plan. And try not, try, I always say, try not to be a hog about it because I know some of us have more needs than others in terms of 
you know, materials and equipment and so forth. But your choir would probably really love to have a brand new piano, you know, or your elementary school program, um, or maybe your maybe the stage piano is really all shot and you need. You agree as a group. This is time for us to buy that grand piano we've always been waiting for holy cow this is now so it's just a matter of thinking about what those things are yeah yeah and I, I think your idea of having a a coherent message from the arts community in your school district I would imagine probably increases your likelihood of mm -hmm. success here when you're coming across and saying we've all communicated and prioritized and this is what we would like to see probably does increase your likelihood of success. And so yeah. I, I love that idea. And so that message needs to be communicated first with the principal and then work its way up through the chain of command and ultimately land at the desk of the individual that manages the federal funds. Is that correct? Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you got to ask for it or they other, they could be turfing the football field if you don't want to go ask right. for the money. So you got to get all out there. All new uniforms and go ask for, for all those football players, but. Uh... And here's the thing, you know, <laughs> if somebody said, well, Nobody told me how to do it. I mean, you, I mean, you can't be like that. We have to say, I heard about it. I did something about it. So it can't be, I sat in this webinar and then nobody came to me to ask me. That's not what's going to happen. You have yeah. to, I'm just trying to make that point very clearly right. that you now need to, if, if you are sitting here listening to this, you need to start like tonight, write that list, you know, and get it going. Call your buddies in your department, get together and have a meeting and say, hey, yeah, Marcia, that's right. Because it, it is grant based, which means you know nobody's going to come down and say, "Hey, we we doubled your repair budget this year because we got these ESSER funds." It's going to be for the people who proactively ask for the money, and so I think that's such a such a good point. Right. Um, so and, and that's one thing fabulous. not to forget about. Sorry to interrupt. One thing not to forget about is that aerosol study that NFHS put together. You can use that as a basis for why you need instrument covers, why you need to have disinfectant, why you need to have other instruments. You know, so you've, we are very fortunate being in the arts and fortunate that, you know, collective was put together to put together the aerosol study. Let's use that with our administrators and make sure that they know, you know, we need to have more instruments so that kids aren't sharing instruments. We need to have bell covers. We need to have the PPE, you know, those, those different things. The other thing is sound systems. If we're all going to be wearing masks next year as educators, you're, you're going to have to project your voice. So why, you know, that money could be used for portable sound systems for classrooms. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. there's, there's so many different, you know, having that brainstorming session, like Marcia said, is, is just the key. Thinking about the all these different that, things. One, one other thing that we haven't really talked about, but it's just so very important is equity because this could be the opportunity for you to tell your principal this, we finally can have what they have down the street, you know, or this is, a, we should start the, this program because it will bring more kids into our program. You know, are, is your program equitable? Um, are you including kids with special needs? If not, is there something that you can do to do that? Um, you know, kids who are homeless, there are kids who are homeless that, you know, would probably love to be part of a program. What can you do about that? So, I mean, so start thinking also in those terms, because then it's not all about what can I get in terms of stuff, but it's also about how you can address the needs of so many kids who may not be in the same place as a lot of the other kids. So just think in those terms as well. Yeah, and I think sowing, also sowing the seeds for building music culture in your community, that is also part of this. You know, bringing in local arts organizations and local arts um, music makers or how can you connect with them to expand your program recruit for your program um, get involved in the things that other community groups are doing that can enhance the arts and music overall in your, in the place that you live I think these these funds can address all those things well and not only that but those organizations also got funding also they so did. they have funding <laughs> Well, I mean, it's great. It's just, there's just, we're abounding in all of this, these resources. So, yeah. That's a great point. Well, Parsha, Heather, Dave, thank, I mean, what a, what a great opportunity this is. And, uh, you know, we were, we're working with a program right now to kind of navigate this process and I was having a conversation with the band director and he said, Hey, this, this could forever change the direction, the trajectory of our program. I mean, it's a small rural school. And they were saying, 
this, this is an opportunity for us to, to your point, Marcia, to put a, a program on the field that's as, as good as these, uh, these wealthy districts. You know, we can get the access to the resources and the tools that we right. need to compete at that next level. And he was ecstatic about it. So a ton yeah, of opportunity absolutely. here ton of opportunity. Uh, last question. It's the same question I ask on after hours. Do you have any final advice or closing thoughts that you would like to share with any of our listeners today? Heather, we'll start with you. Anything that you would, you would share in closing? Um, just that this is really a one time in a generation funding. That's, I, I heard this being talked, talked about on NPR, uh, the national program the other day, and they really said this, this is unprecedented amount of money going into education the biggest amount in a generation. So that's that's how important it is that we understand it and go for it in, in music and in, in the arts. Um, so it, it, it's very heartening that we that we have this opportunity and I'm, I'm glad to help anybody learn about it. Thanks, Heather. Dave, how about you? Anything you might add? Uh, I, yeah, I mean, just to echo Heather's comments, it, it's it's amazing. And I think it's really, if, if we are advocating for our programs, we can really get this money. Uh, not to confuse it, I just want to mention one small thing. There's also the higher ed version of this. So we just talked a lot about ESSER. And if you've got listeners that are part of uh, colleges and universities, there's the equivalent, which is H-E-E-R, HER. Uh, same thing, one, two, and three. That money was from the feds directly to the universities. So a lot of that went to the students, half of it went to the students, and then half of it went to the university. So there's a lot of money for uh, higher education to access money for federal grants as well. So Google that. We also have information on our website, so you can check that out. But uh, there's, there's just a ton of money. Ask, advocate, and get, get it for your program. Yeah, great. Thanks, Dave. Marsha, anything that you might add in closing? Yeah, um, this, is a, this is a really quick story. Of course I have something to say, please. Um, when a former one of my superintendents was leaving, he sent me a message and he said, I have some extra funds. So I want you to send me a list of anything that you think you might need for your music program in Clark County and think big. So I wrote up a request for about $175,000 worth of instruments for you know schools that really needed it. So I submitted it and he called me up. He said, Marsha, I told you to think big. So I'm telling you people, you need to think big. I mean, think beyond what your wildest dreams, if money were no object, what would I request and, and start there? Yeah, that's a great point, Marsha. Well, Heather, Dave, Marsha, thank you so much for being part of After Hours and really thank you to, to, to all of you and to Yamaha for your leadership and guiding us through this time. I mean, this is all new and um, I, I just applaud all of your efforts and, and your team at Yamaha, the way you're helping educators navigate this entire process because I think the opportunities abound, but we've got to get out there. We've got to advocate for our program and ensure that music is a part of the success story when we return back to school and after COVID. So thank you all. I appreciate your efforts. Thanks for being on After Hours. For all of our listeners, just as a quick reminder, next episode will be April 6th as we have a conversation about how to maximize the relationships with your superintendent, your school principal, and your school board. And so it should be a wonderful conversation as we welcome a panel from each of those three constituents and talk about their role in music education. So for everybody, have a wonderful evening. Stay safe, wash your hands, wear a mask. We've almost made it through this. We're at the end. You got this. And we'll see you on April 6th for After Hours, Conversations for Music Educators. Good night, everyone. Thank night. you. So Thank much. you. Appreciate it. You've been listening to After Hours, Conversations for Music Educators, presented by Amro Music. This podcast features conversations with music educators who are finding innovative ways to teach their students. You can hear and see more conversations at amromusic.com slash afterhours.